When life gives you lemons, I say, use them in your favorite lemon recipes. On today's show, meet exotic plant expert, Byron Martin, who's brought his lemon tree collection to teach us all about the different kinds of lemons. Then join me in the kitchen for two recipes using lemons in a very unexpected way. We're going to make a lemon and Italian cheese pizza and also a Meyer lemon coffee cake. Plus, my friend and baker John Baricelli is here with his recipe for a spectacular lemon souffle tart. All today on Martha Bakes. Lemons come in all shapes, all sizes, and colors. Horticulturist and good friend Byron Martin brings with him a wealth of knowledge by way of his grandfather's love of exotic plants. And today, he's here, welcome, uh, with a small sampling from his really large collection of lemon trees. I'm very happy to have you here, and it's amazing that the lemons have all gotten here still on the branch. Yes, it was quite a process, wow. but we made it. <laughs> Your um, greenhouses are in which town? Danielson, Connecticut. Danielson, that's northeastern Connecticut. Northeastern Connecticut. Yep. When did you start really concentrating on lemons in such a big way? Well, in 1900, the Ponderosa came into our um, collection, and that generation collected Meyer lemons and oranges and such things. As that, that was your grandfather? Yeah, it was my, and my uh, mother and uncle oh, okay. in, that, in that second generation. So the collection was really there by the time I got there. It's just we've expanded it since then with odds and ends and whatever we can find. Well, about 15 years ago, the Ponderosa came into my yes. collection. <laughs> and this is what I'm getting from I that know. tree that I bought from you. <laughs> Look at the size of this. How many yeah. pounds do you think that is? Oh, that's got at least two, two and a half, right. maybe three. And that's yeah. a lemon. I am so proud of yeah. my lemon tree, my Ponderosa yeah, These are tree. very nice, very Yeah, they nice are fruit. good fruit, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're not, um, you know, I pick them a little bit green. I usually wait yeah. until they're really yellow, right. but I wanted to show you how yes. successful Beautiful. Beautiful. your tree has been. Yes. Um, and so the Ponderosa was the first of the, of the citrus trees? Right. That oh. was brought in in 1900. We still have her wow. today. She's yeah. planted in the ground. Oh, no, I love it. that yes. tree. That's what, yeah. that's what encouraged me to get one. Yeah way back. Yeah, and so it's uh, actually a cross between a citron and the table lemon. Right, and that's why this, the skin, skin is so, is so thick. thick yeah. And the fruit is very large. And do you use the juice? The juice is fine, yeah. yeah I like it. Yes, it's very nice. And, so uh, and it really makes a, a lot of juice from one lemon. Yes. How much fruit can you expect to get from one lemon tree? Um, a good producing tree like the one we have on our right hand side yeah, here, one. which is about as big as you'd probably have it in a container, can put up to two dozen fruit or mm. even more. This plant here has been pruned back a little bit, so the fruit production's so a little... So these are lemons, these green fruits yes. that are hanging, those and they, are And you can lemons. see they're just starting to turn. Yeah. In another month or two, they'll be um, yellow. Bright yellow. Is this a Meyer lemon? This is the Meyer yeah, lemon. Yeah, oh, and it's, they're yeah. so smooth. The skin is so, it's so yeah. smooth. Yeah, when did the Meyer lemon become so popular? I would say probably in the last 10, 20 years. Um, but it was brought into the country in 1900. From and, where? Um, it's a Chinese hybrid between a sour orange and a lemon. Uh -huh. The good thing about the Meyer, other than the fact that the flavor is so much more intense and rich, is that it can take cold temperatures. Are these the Meyer lemons too? Yeah, okay. these are Meyers. So I'm going to cut yeah. one just to show people what it looks like inside. And it is seedier than, yeah. uh, than a Eureka or table. Oh, table but the one. taste is, yeah. it's a unique taste. What about the variegated? That's a beautiful tree too. Yeah, that, this is more like a Eureka type lemon. This has less seeds inside of it and it's a variegated form obviously. And the it, fruit is variegated. Is one of those ripe or not? Um, I think there's one there that's just starting to ripen the oh. larger one. We could probably pick it off and yeah, cut it. Yeah, can we yeah. try? Yeah. Is that the pinkish color? Yeah, so here's one that's- Wait till you see this everyone. Yeah, so this one here is, you see, it started to turn oh, pink. Yeah, the others are actually one. green on that. Oh, that's beautiful, and, yes. Um, now look how large this is. I, I would probably wait until it was a little bit softer. Yeah, I would leave it on the but tree. But I want to show everyone what it looks like. Look, hardly a seed and bright, beautiful yeah. pink. It almost looks like a <gasps> pink grapefruit, but if you tasted it, it'd be very little it sugar. It is so special. Well, then we have a citron, which is the hybrid off of that, and this is the Buddha's hand. Look at and, all the fingers on that particular right. fruit. And this is actually like a Buddha's fist. Right. Uh, when they grow them commercially, they actually, the fingers come out. So you'd find them in the store around Christmas time with the fingers coming out. And this is 
actually a citron, but it has really no pulp inside. It's just the rind that you eat. And yes, and, and many chefs are just grating that yes, into it's food. It's quite delicious. Oh, it is. It's, it has a sweet, sweet rind yeah. to it. So that'll ripen more at Christmas time. Oh yeah, it's got a ways to go. And then um, the citron itself, which is the, the long oblong fruit, has an interior pulp that's sour just and like And that's what we candy for fruitcakes. Right. So how easy is it if you have just a backyard and a sun porch, how easy is it to keep a tree? It's quite easy. As a matter of fact, citrus are probably some of the best tropical or container fruiting plants you can try. And the reason being is they can take quite a bit of dryness. Uh -huh. So you can forget to water them and they'll still be there. I mean, there's an extreme that you can't. Um, they produce, as you can see, they'll produce as very young trees, so you don't have to wait too long. Right. This is a ponderosa that we brought that is covered with flowers. Yeah, that'll, and, that'll get at least one yeah, real at least, fruit. Yeah, you'll get at least one lemon off of that. And the other thing is, is that, um, you know, they can tolerate the home conditions. So as long as you've got a sunny window to grow them in and you pay attention to your watering, it's pretty much foolproof. I'm sure I cut one of these. I should. Yes, let's Yeah, we one haven't of cut one of these. I'll cut this one. Ready, everybody? Oh, it's juicy. <laughs> Look at that. So it looks more like a grapefruit inside. Yeah, and you can see it is quite mm. seedy. Such um, a... It has a very thick rind, and that actually is the um, part of the citron. Citron, yeah. yeah. The citron. So we can candy that. Yes, and you can smell it. The, oh, the boy, aromatics is it coming out strong. of that is, is really quite something. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it always has that strong yeah, smell. So thing. beautiful. Well, Byron, thank you so much for visiting with us again today and bringing your beautiful specimens here. You always have so much great information for us. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I know it may sound like a strange combination, but trust me when I tell you that my lemon and Italian cheese pizza is outrageously delectable. The tangy, paper-thin slices of citrus pair perfectly with melted piave and fontina cheeses. The dough is simple, a basic pizza crust dough. We first proof one package of active dry yeast in two cups of warm water. And the water should be no warmer than 115 degrees and we want it to become like this, dissolved, and you want to see a little bit of action on the top of the water, little tiny bubbles. That way you know the yeast is alive. Let this one sit for about five minutes. In a large bowl, we have three cups of all-purpose flour, and to that we're going to add two teaspoons of fine sea salt. Stir that up, and then you can make a well if you want, or whatever way you're going to incorporate all this yeasty water into all that flour. It's going to be very, very wet. And by making a well, you can gradually add the flour, the dry, to the wet. I'm using a good sturdy wooden spoon to help mix. And because it's so wet, you're going to add up to two additional cups of flour to this dough. So now you can start adding. The first cup, just sprinkle it on. You don't have to dump it all in. Now you can, of course, make this in the stand mixer fitted with a dough hook. It'll save what my dad always called that elbow grease, but it's kind of fun to make pizza dough and use your arm muscles. And again, the addition of the flour, sometimes it'll take all two cups. Sometimes you'll need a little bit more depending on the day. And you can put some of the extra flour right here on your counter. Pull up your sleeves and get ready to knead. And it helps to use a pastry scraper whenever you're kneading dough. This will lift the dough and allow you to make those initial folds. And it might take up to 10 minutes to get this into a nice smooth ball of dough and have a large bowl ready with some olive oil in the bowl, and that will be the rising bowl. Coat the entire surface with oil, and then cover with plastic wrap, and let it rise in a warm place until double in volume, approximately three hours. So here's our dough, doubled in bulk, and there's no reason to buy pizza dough. It's so nice to make your own. I make my own, my daughter makes her own, my niece makes her own beautiful, beautiful dough. And using your pastry cutter, cut into quarters. What you want to do is just make this into a nice round. Notice how I'm folding up the edges 
You don't want a lot of air bubbles in your pizza. Flour a baking sheet lightly, cover, and let the dough rise for another 30 minutes. And I think we have a swap out for this one too. So here's our dough, nicely risen. Take one of the balls, and if it's gonna take you a little time, keep this in the fridge so it doesn't overproof. You can also put them in the freezer. Oh boy, look at this, so pretty. Just a lightly floured surface. And you want to push the dough out to a circle about 12 inches in diameter. You can go around and around like this using the backs of your hands. Now put this right on a lightly floured peel. Now, a few little red onions. So a quarter of a red onion, some piave cheese. Two ounces of the cheese should be enough for one pizza. Some thin lemon slices, six, which will give you six perfect slices. And some, oh, Fontina cheese. Two ounces will melt perfectly under the heat that we're going to bake this. 500 degrees and a little bit of oven broiler. Some little sprigs of rosemary. You don't want a lot of rosemary, just want a few sprigs here and there. And black pepper. I'm not adding any salt, the cheese is salty enough. And then a little drizzle of very good olive oil. Ready for the oven. Now your oven should be preheated to 500 degrees for at least one hour with your pizza stone on the bottom rack, if that's an electric oven, or on the floor of a gas oven. Don't overshoot the stone. I start it where I want the pizza to land and I just gently squiggle the peel. Close the oven. So now broil until bubbles begin to form around the edges, three to four minutes. And then we are going to reduce the temperature to oven heat of 500 degrees and bake for another six to eight minutes. Our time is up. Oh boy, so gorgeous. That is a gorgeous pizza. Nothing burned, beautiful crust, beautiful melted top, and it smells spectacular. And if you like, make a little dressing of lemon juice, olive oil, salt, and pepper for a fresh green salad. Not too much dressing. Enjoy the most delicious lemony cheese pizza you will have ever tasted. Mmm, so good. Meyer lemons with their mellow complexity take classic coffee cake to an entirely new level. Let's begin with the streusel topping, which of course is very important on any coffee cake. In a medium bowl, mix together one and three quarters cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of coarse salt, and three quarters of a cup of light brown sugar, densely packed. Make sure there are no lumps. Mix this all together and cut in one and a half sticks of unsalted icy cold butter cut into small cubes and cut that in as if you were making a pastry dough. You want the streusel to form nice big fat lumps. So you see as the butter softens it kind of melts the sugar a little bit and even the color changes for the streusel. If you have a warm kitchen get the streusel right into a refrigerator to keep it cold. So now the lemons, how do we prepare them? We were using five lemons, we've cut off the stem end and the tip end, and you just put them into simmering water. We're going to boil any of the bitterness out of the lemons. And they're sliced into, oh, maybe 10 or 12 slices each. Do this once, remove to a parchment lined baking sheet, change the water, and then simmer them again. So in a large bowl, this is the batter for our coffee cake two cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, and one and a half teaspoons of salt. Whisk that together, and you should have by now, while your lemons were poaching and becoming more mellow, buttered very generously a tube pan like this, which is like an angel food cake pan with a removable center. And now to mix the rest of the batter. Cream one stick of butter, and that should be pretty much at room temperature so it's nice and soft. 
and one cup of granulated sugar. This is a very nice, simple sour cream coffee cake batter. Cream that. We have three tablespoons of Meyer lemon zest, grated from about four or five Meyer lemons. And add that right into your sugar and butter. And you can add two eggs, one at a time. And one teaspoon of vanilla extract. And then add your sour cream. We have one cup of good quality sour cream. And add flour, sour cream, flour, and with sour cream. And don't beat it too much, just enough to make sure everything is incorporated. Now spoon half the batter into the bottom of your tube pan. And now Put lemons all the way around on top of the batter. You really want to cut through a layer of gorgeous flavor. There. That looks very good. And another layer of batter. So now the next layer of lemons. Hmm, lovely. And now streusel. And you can do this with your hands if you like. Get that right into your 350 degree preheated oven. Bake for about 55 minutes until the cake is golden brown. And when you insert a toothpick or a cake tester into the center, it comes out clean. So cool the cake in the pan for 10 or 12 minutes. Release it onto a rack and let it cool completely. And just before serving, Sift one cup of confectioner sugar and mix in three to four tablespoons of Meyer lemon juice. You want a nice opaque white glaze. And that looks good. No lumps. And with a spoon, just drizzle back and forth over the cake. You could put this in a pastry bag if you wish, but a spoon works perfectly well. Transfer the cake to a beautiful cake stand. Make yourself a big cup of coffee and enjoy a big piece of cake. Bakery owner and good friend John Baricelli knows how much I love lemon desserts, don't you, John? Yeah. And today he's here with a recipe that has a delicious twist. It's a lemon souffle tart. It's really nice to be back in the kitchen with you. Oh, thank and you. I, yeah, same I here. missed our collaborations. <laughs> and we're going to make a tart. And you make um, a pat sucre crust. I do crust. A pat sucre, butter, sugar, pinch of salt, like everything I put in uh, my, my recipes. I'm going to start on the tart dough. OK, so you're making it in the bowl of a stand mixer. Correct. Oh, OK. And I like the creaming method. Start off with two sticks of butter. And to that, we're going to add a quarter cup of sugar. And the butter should be malleable, you know, so you don't want it too warm. It's got to right. be cold enough so that it doesn't separate. Sort of like room temperature if Correct. your room is not too I put too my hot. thumb in it. If it goes in easily, then okay. I know it's okay. So if you want to crack me some eggs. Of course. I need a, one egg and one yolk. And then a teaspoon of salt. And I'll save the egg white, okay? Yes, always. We're going to use it for the meringue. Oh, okay. But anyway, so... This is the tart dough. You just add the eggs gradually. If it separates, you don't have to worry because the flour is just gonna pull it right back together. Right. And I don't beat it too much because I don't want volume. And then two cups of... All purpose? All purpose. So just a good all purpose, unbleached, unbromated flour. There's no reason to have yeah. um, any, any bleach. In. And then you just jog it. And then it's gonna come together in a matter of seconds. They have a lot of flour up here, does that matter? We'll get it out. And that's it. It comes together almost like a cookie dough. So we're just gonna get this into some plastic. There's right. your two discs. Okay, they can go right into the fridge. And, Put these away. And then, are you gonna do the lemon curd all at once? Yes. You can start off by doing the eggs. Yeah. Okay. Seven large egg yolks. Two thirds of a cup of lemon juice. Fresh lemon juice. Only fresh. Of course. Okay. The sugar. How much? This is a half a cup. And again, a pinch of salt. And then afterwards, we're just going to finish it with the butter. 
and then we strain it last. After yes. the butter is added. How about lemon zest? Lemon zest we're gonna put in. Like a teaspoon or but just I, one lemon? I, listen, if you like lemon, you can put in the whole thing, as yeah. far as I'm concerned. And time to add the butter. Sure. Then you're gonna strain it, let it set, let it cool. Then we make the meringue, fold them together. Oh, I see, and okay. And then we place it into the pre-baked pie shell. Oh, okay. So this is good enough. The one thing I like to do about pastries, you can do all this stuff when kids are sleeping, when you have uh, extra time, you can- um, Like who of us has extra time for anything? <laughs> but uh. you can see what you're straining out there, right? Yes. Little bits of egg, and that's why we strain it last. Yes. So we're gonna chill that down. We're gonna roll out our tart shell. Okay. Okay. All right, we're gonna try to get this in. You can just mold it. It's almost like a push-in dough. And then you're gonna make the parchment paper that's gonna fit in here. Yeah, we're I gonna pre-bake it. I made it. one. Oh, you made one of it? I try to make sort of a round, and then I crumple it all up. Do you crumple yours? I do. It's just where they fit into the corners yeah. better. I just like to clean up the edges a little. Of course. You use the palm of your hand. You can use the rolling pin, which I don't prefer because you get little nicks in there. And then- In the rolling pin. Right. Yes. So this is gonna <laughs> freeze you. now for about 15 minutes. It's nice and cold. Put our parchment paper on, and then the beans that are probably 100 years old go right in top. Oh, they're even older than that. <laughs> <laughs> Just to the edge. Okay. So this is gonna go into an oven of 375 for about 15 to 20 minutes, okay. or until it's golden brown. Okay. Everybody's oven is different, so just make sure it's okay. cooked through. So here is the beautiful crust ready to be filled. Here's your chilled curd. Yes. And then we're gonna start on the meringue. So I like to just put a pinch of salt in the very beginning, and then as it starts to foam, we add the sugar. You know, if you add it all too fast, it just sinks to the bottom, you're gonna have a very heavy, wet meringue. Oh, I see. Okay, then just as it starts to foam, right down the side. So that is the seven egg whites from the curd plus the one. From the pat soup tray. That's right. So, so you don't waste a thing. You can see how this is getting glossy. You don't want to overbeat. Exactly. And then we're going to start folding in. And this is going to pile up very yeah. high. And then if you want to get a little decorative, you can do a little swirl. You can leave it as is. I like it as rustic as possible. And then you can actually leave it a little bit just undermixed. Okay. I like that little bit of marbling. Okay, and then I pile it. Mm. Doesn't it look awesome already? Really awesome. This is gonna go into an oven, 375 degrees, top rack, and about 25 minutes, Martha. You're oh. gonna check it. Okay. So John, here it is. So it really flattens out. It kind of flattens out, but it's still got that nice souffle texture. You can feel it. Mm. Let it set for about 30 minutes, and then we're gonna unmold it. Okay. And then you can serve it at room temperature. So John, that is so beautiful. Should I dust? Sure. And you can use a stencil if you'd like. Once the meringue is cold, the, the sugar won't melt. How big of a piece that do you much? want? That much? That's good. Well, I've been eating so much, a little <laughs> sliver to start. <laughs> okay. So light and so airy. It almost looks like a ricotta cheesecake. Oh, it's so good. So John, your baked goods never disappoint. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you for having me. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. I love ricotta. After my Sunday pasta meal, I like to put my ricotta on a crusty piece of Italian bread, put some fresh figs on top. It goes from sweet to savory in a heartbeat. Also, instead of whipped cream, I like to dollop a little bit of ricotta on my waffles, a little bit of homemade jam, and then for dessert, Nothing like a grilled peach with a little bit of ricotta and then some nice granola. This is a great dessert and nobody would ever think that it was from ricotta left over in your refrigerator.